tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Welcome, dear listener, to Fear from the Heartland. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. Set aside some moments now and take an adventurous ride on a journey into the psyche of some talented writers. They will dig into your being and titillate you. Oh, I love that word, titillate. While the stories may not all take place in the heartland, I am delivering them to you from the heartland. My intention is to strike fear and confusion into the mind, soul, and yes, the heart. This is Fear from the Heartland. Hello, Heartlanders, and welcome to Season 2, Episode 1 of Fear from the Heartland. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. And just like that, it's a new year. How in the hell did that happen? Because of you, dear listeners, I can honestly say, Wifey and I had a special 2021 and to look forward to a unique and eerily fun ride in 2022. For any new folks to fear from the heartland, I refer to wifey as she is my wife, as well as my uber-talented producer and writer of all the original music you hear on Fear from the Heartland. She makes me sound good. Two spine tinglers tonight, brought to us by authors Dirk Stevens and Eli Pope. Let's get after it. Bob. When Alice left him, it flat tore the soul out of that boy. I only brought him out to Uncle Ed's old hunting cabin so we could talk it out. Maybe give him a reason to keep living. Never occurred to me he thought I was who she was stepping on with. I gotta get the hell out of here. If I can even tell what's real and what ain't with that poison he give me fogging up my mind. And now, for your indulgence. Dryad by Dirk Stevens. I guess if I squint hard and crank my head just right, that there tree does kind of seem to have curves like a woman. But with the ice cover in the glass, Bob's crap headlights, and the fat, nasty pile of well, God knows what all, covering the dash, it's hard to tell. Still, I'm pretty sure that faded lime green streak on the trunk is supposed to be the bikini Uncle Ed painted on it years ago. That's gotta be her. Turn right. Boy, you out of your mind. Bob rubs a patch of windshield clear frost and ducks his head low to peer through. They don't look like no woman I ever saw. How long was it since your aunt died? Shut up. I drop the map and point at the trees rising through the darkness on all sides. You better turn that wheel or we ain't never gonna find that cabin. Now turn. Bob hunches his shoulders like he always does when he knows better than to argue. He scratches his nose with his middle finger in my direction and then jerks the shifter lever towards the seat. The old Ford's engine roars. The wheels spin as the truck lunges off the blacktop and down that dirt road like a dog catching a scent. Cheetos, bags, crumpled up bills and letters from Bob's divorce attorney go flying off the dash every which way as the seat bounces off from under me. I chuck one hand up against the roof to keep my head from hitting metal, brace my other on the door, and pray the dang thing don't kick open and toss me out. Bob laughs when my face hits the side window, but I don't complain. I don't say nothing. Not about the mouse stink blowing out the defroster. Not about the garbage flying around the cab or the fact there ain't no seatbelts. 
I don't even say nothing about how we're even supposed to shoot deer with rifles who have been bouncing around the pickup bed like a pair of ping pong balls. None of that matters anyhow. This trip ain't about hunting. Not really. It's about Bob, Alice, getting away and talking about all that crap men don't talk about unless they're standing in front of an open hood. Funny how men are. Talk about anything broke as long as it ain't feelings. But throw a gun or an engine in the mix, and suddenly that's all it's about. How she's tore up all to hell and needs a rebuild. The truck bounces hard and a metallic crack somewhere beneath the floorboard rakes chills down my spine. Uncle Ed said it was a good five miles to the nearest neighbor, and the high is supposed to hit ten below, maybe. Now, I was hoping for some kind of metaphor to get Bob talking, but I sure as hell hope it ain't the truck. About a mile off the blacktop, the road turns into wherever Uncle Ed could squeeze his truck in through the trees. It's rough, steep, and to make it even worse, the snow's coming down so hard I can barely see anything past the end of the hood. When Ed's one-room log cabin finally pokes into view, it's a heaven sent. Ain't nothing fancy, just a rough job with a porch thrown together out of some old cedar logs he stole off a neighbor when they cleared their place for grazing. Bob pulls the truck up till the bumper almost greets the porch and slams the tranny into first to kill the engine. He looks out the window, eyeballing the place something fierce. So this is Buckhaven, huh? Yup. I shoulder open the door and step down into the snow. It crunches under my boots as I turn and grab my duffel bag. Ed said he ain't been here in years, so don't expect nothing pretty. You want to start the fire or carry stuff in? Bob don't move. He just sits there chewing on his gloves, staring at the porch. Don't look homey. He sniffs. I swear there better be two beds in there, cause I ain't sharing no bunk with you. That idea never even entered my head. With a yup, I kick the door closed and stomp up onto the porch. The door's held shut by a piece of wire Ed bent like a hook and stuffed through an old twisted nail. Fumbling to get my flashlight out of my bag, I pop the hook open with my elbow. The door swings with low moaning squeak. Out of habit or instinct, or God knows why, I sniff the air. Something's wrong. It ought to smell like mice or mildew or dust, but it don't. It smells like smoke, and I take a deep lungful. Bacon. Not sure what to think, I flick on the flashlight. What the hell are you sniffing at? Bob stomps towards the door. Something better not have died in there. Nah, it ain't that. I shine the light over the table with two chairs set up all neat and clean front and center. The bunk beds under the window to the left, the tiny kitchen with the wood stove to the right. It's all set up, all clean. Someone's been here not too long ago. Your uncle says squatters pop in sometimes. Pop stomps up onto the porch and takes a long gaze around the place. Well, whoever they are, they saved us a hell of a lot of work. Might even get some hunting done today. He elbows me in the ribs and pushes his way inside. Seeing as you can't cook, why don't you grab the cooler and I'll make us some breakfast. Before I get a chance saying anything, he walks over to the beds, chucks his sleeping bag on the top bunk, and tosses a smirk back over his shoulder. Dibs. A couple hours later, I'm hunched up, shivering under the skirt of some low-hanging cedar branches overlooking a meadow. It seemed like a good spot, nice and sheltered from the snow. A creek trickles at the far end where the snows reached about an inch deep. I eased on in nice and quiet like and settled down. The temperature's colder than hell, but that ain't the problem. My head's spinning, and I got this nasty copper taste in the back of my mouth I just can't seem to get rid of. It could be Bob's cooking, lack of shut-eye or COVID, seeing how much that waitress down at the cafe was coughing last night. Hoping for the best, I unscrew the cap of my thermos and try to drown the taste with another sip of coffee. But it's Bob's brew, so thick it could horseshoe. Licking the grinds from between my teeth, I decide I'll be making the coffee from now on. 
The thermos crunches against the thin layer of snow as I set it down next to me again, but before I can pry my chilling fingers free, something moves between the trees off to the side. Staying as quiet and slow as I can, I slide my rifle off my lap and pull my knee up to use as a rest. But I don't shoulder it. I don't even put around in the chamber. It's not time. Not yet. At the far end of the clearing, a branch moves. Something rustles in the brush, and then the branch seems to hover out toward the open. It's hard to see with all the snow coming down like it is, but there ain't anything attached to the branch. Nothing I can see anyhow. It's like it's hovering in the air, all on its own. I blink and rub the ice cold from my eyelashes. It's the cold. I ain't seen it right. When I look up again, there's not one floating branch, but two, side by side. Identical ones. Almost like antlers. Except the brown animal that they should be on ain't there. It's hard to tell for certain, but they sure as hell seem floating out into the middle of the open, dangling on invisible strings. For a second, I wonder if Bob's playing some kind of joke, but there ain't no way he could pull this off, even if he wanted to. Staring extra hard between the snowflakes for the body that has to be there but ain't, I pinch the bridge of my nose and shake my head. This just ain't possible. I'm losing my dang mind out here. I just glance down at the thermos, wondering if Bob's put something extra in them grounds when a shadow moves in the clearing. I can't really see nothing thanks to all the snow coming down, but between the snowflakes, a red eye appears right under one of them branches, the shadows of an ear flicks. But before I can really make it out, it turns and disappears again into the curtain of fallen snow. But I know what I saw and it's almost as impossible as floating antlers. My heart skips the next few beats. It's an albino, a white buck. Ed always told stories about some albino deer he had seen once or twice, but that's all they was, stories. Three, four, five, six, and a drop tine. My voice mumbles, barely a whisper as I count the tip of each antler. Hands shaking, I keep as quiet as I can while I slide the bolt of my rifle back, load the shell into the chamber, and creep the stock up against my shoulder. This ain't just a trophy buck. He's a white 14-pointer. This one's a record. History. Right here. Closing one eye, I peek through the scope. The buck's ear twitches, but he don't act nervous at all. And now that I know what he is, the outline and shadows are obvious even behind all the snow and brush, I pull the crosshairs down from his head, over his neck to the shoulder knuckle marking his heart, and gently squeeze the trigger. The rifle jumps and a deafening roar shakes the snow from the surrounding trees, and I lose sight of him in the cloud. I ought to wait. The best chance is to sit and let him have his final moments alone, but something this big is more than I can take. Jumping up like some dang greenhorn, I jam my shoulder through the sling and dart out into the meadow. But he ain't there. Just a tuft of fur and a few dark splotches of red sprayed out on the snow. And that's when I see it. The flecks of green scattered between the blood like something from a nightmare. Kneeling down, I pinch a thick green blob between my forefinger and thumb and curse under my breath. It's half-digested grass. My stomach turns, but I know exactly what this means. All that bouncing of Bob's truck on the road must have knocked the scope out of line. The gun didn't aim right, and I hit him too far back. Now I gotta track him down if I can. I better, cause gut shot is about the worst way dying possible. No creature deserves that. Not one. Letting the poor bastard's last meal fall from my fingers, I grab my stuff and stumble off to follow the trail. Luckily his tracks and blood are clear as day on the white snow. But that ain't gonna last. If the snow don't stop falling soon, it won't take long to bury everything. I pull the ear flaps tight against my cheeks and dust the snow from the top of my head. Nope, I ain't got much time at all. I'm puffing like a steam engine by the time the cabin's outline rises out of the fallen snow. 
I ran the last half hour or so, but it's still dark by the time I make it back to the cabin. Stopping to catch my breath, I peek back over my shoulder to make sure I weren't followed. I take my time scanning the woods nice and easy, picking apart every shadow, every twig, but nothing moves. She didn't follow, but it's too dark to tell for dead sure. Letting go of that breath I've been holding, I turn back to the cabin. Even through the haze of snow and naked scrub surrounding the place, the dancing yellow light in the window's too bright to look at. But Bob's in there, and by the smell of it, he's got supper going. Not that it matters, I couldn't eat nothing anyhow. The smell of them biscuits on the wind is just about enough to change my mind. But right now, I'm just happy knowing I ain't here alone. I climb up onto the porch, stomp the snow off my boots, slip the rifle off my shoulder, and much as I don't want to, pick the live round out of the chamber before heading inside. I barely get the door closed behind me when Bob says, Heard the shot. You get him? Blinking out the light, I shake my head and prop my rifle up against the wall. I take my time sliding out my coat and hanging it on one of them wooden pegs by the door. Gut shot. Bob's spoon clinks like a gong against the side of the pot. Find him? Nope. I whisper as I work my foot out of my boot. Truth is, I ain't used to running so far in the snow and my leg won't hold. She gives way and I have to lean against the wall just so I can pull off the other end without falling over. You all right? Bob grunts more than asks. I don't look at him. I can't look at him right now, but I can feel him watching as I fumble a chair out from under the table and flop down. I don't know, Bob. I think I got the COVID or some dang thing. I don't feel right. I bury my face in my palms as I fight to get my thoughts together. To come up with some way of telling him what happened that doesn't sound completely loco. You think maybe there's more living out here than we think? Just hearing it out loud like that makes me wince. Bob shuffles over and sets a tin plate down on the table in front of me. You run into a neighbor or something? I shake my head. No. I slide my hands down my nose as I look up at him. He seems older now, since the divorce. The stubble on his chin's gone gray and the wrinkles around his eyes got deeper. Not people. I mean, like, creatures. I watch his left eyebrow twitch up, but he don't say nothing, so I keep going. Remember how Uncle Ed used to tell them stories? You mean with all them fairies and crap? Bob's watching me close now, his steel blue eyes flicking back and forth like he can't decide which one of mine to look at. Them was just stories he made up to get the young'uns to go to sleep. You know that. I thought I did. I shrug, but I can't say what needs saying. Not while I'm looking him in the eye, so I go to picking at the edge of my plate instead. That book I shot was an albino, and I swear to God he was the biggest damn bastard I ever saw just like that white stag in one of Ed's fairy tales. But this one, he was real. I shot him, found the blood trail and everything, except I got him in the gut. He run off. I trailed him down by that old creek and a lump catches in my throat. It's gonna take a second before I can get the rest out. So you shot an albino and lost him? Bob shrugs and scoops a spoonful of baked beans on my plate. That don't mean nothing. We'll get out first light and have him skinned out by dinner. But he ain't getting it. I didn't lose him, I mumble. I can track way better than you, Bob. I found that buck all piled up nice and pretty right down by the creek. My jaw goes tense. Up till now, it's just a strange hunting story. Every inch of me is screaming for me to just shut up and just play it cool. But I can't. It weren't no dream. And if it was, I'm sicker than I thought. So I swallow hard and force the words to come. He weren't alone. There was this tree woman thing hunched over his body, patting his fur and crying like she just lost her true love or something. 
And there I was, maybe 20 yards away, just standing there, staring at her like a dumbass. I flicked the side of my plate, unable to look at him. She saw me. She looked right at me and gave me a look like she was ready to carve my liver. So I run. I run as fast and hard as I ever done in my whole life, till I couldn't run no more. I take a deep, ragged breath and glance at Bob's belt buckle peeking up over the edge of the table. She was real, Bob. She had white bark skin, dried brown grass for hair, a dress that looked like moss, and these eyes. Pressure builds behind my nose and I have to put my fist to my mouth to stifle the cry. They was big and bright green. Like, too green. So green they almost glowed green. Bob mutters something under his breath. I think something about consciousness, but I can't quite make it out. But then he clears his throat. Slumping around to the other side of the table, he dumps a spoonful of beans on his own plate and says, Maybe you ought to have another cup of coffee. I dreamed about her, the tree woman, her face twisted into a scowl, them green eyes staring at me from behind a curtain of brown grass. She leaned in close enough so I could see the black veins in her irises, smell the wild flowers and moist earth on her breath when she opened her mouth and hissed, Murderer. I jolted straight up, drenched in sweat, the taste of copper so strong in my mouth I didn't even balk at Bob's nasty gritty coffee when he handed me the cup. Truth be told, when he offered to skip a day of hunting so I could show him where it happened, I nodded and slammed it down in a single gulp so I wouldn't have to taste it. But I didn't complain. He knew I couldn't go back there alone. And I have to. I have to know. I have to see for myself if I'm going crazy. That was three hours ago. I trudge along through knee-deep snow with my rifle slung over my shoulder and Bob at my side, trying not to let on how freaked I really am. He don't believe a word about that tree woman, and I don't blame him, but he came along anyway. That's the thing about Bob, though. He's one ornery, bad-tempered, vindictive cuss, but he's always been there. He's always been willing to give me the benefit of the doubt, even in the craziest times. Like now, here I was bringing him out here so as I could help him get over his divorce, and he ends up walking me through... Whatever the hell brand of crazy this is. I tongue the grounds out of my teeth and spit them into the snow. I guess he'd be about the perfect friend. If his coffee was worth half a turd. I spot the edge of the creek where the buck's trail turned and dropped down into a little flat area by the water. He come right between them trees. I say, trying to hide the shake in my voice as I point at a couple of oaks growing close together and try to walk Bob through my thinking. I reckon he caught my scent, because he stopped up short here, then followed that little path right there on the edge of that draw. Bob nods, taking it all in as I explain, but then he looks down at his boots and kicks a little divot in the snow, wearing that face he makes when he's trying hard to think about it, say something he don't want to. We stand there for a while, My heart pounding in my ears as I wait for him to put it all together. I'm pretty dang sure he's working up to tell me, you're crazier than a hoot owl. But he must not figure out the right words, cause he just groans, well lead on. I don't want to. It's slipperier working down the path than it was yesterday. But I nod and ease on down the trail. Right now more than anything, I want my rifle at the ready but I leave it slung over my back. I need to keep my hands free in case I slip. With the new snow, there ain't no tracks to follow, but I don't need them. I wish I could forget, but I think 20 years from now, I'll still be able to come back and walk this path blindfolded. As soon as the ground levels out, I pull my rifle from my back, cycle around into the chamber and wave my hand, telling Bob to get ready. His rifle clicks, then clacks as he works the lever forward and back. But I don't turn around. I don't take my eyes off the cedar just ahead of me. The last cover there is between me and the buck, where that tree woman was. 
Crouching low, I hook the top of the branch with the end of my muzzle and push it aside. But there's nothing there. I dip my head to the side and search the rock wall to the left, the sway of the creek to the right, and the absolutely empty clearing in between. I'll get it, I hiss. He was here. Heart pounding, my eyes dissecting every shadow, I step out into the clearing. He was right here. I spin around in a tight circle, scanning the ground. Coyotes get it? Bob asks. I glance up just in time to see him let the branch flop down behind him as he enters the clearing. I shake my head. It don't make no sense. There's no tracks, no blood, no fur. The copper taste comes back with the vengeance. Letting my gun drop, I grab my head in both hands and flop down on my butt right beside it in the snow. There was never anything here, was there? I'm going crazy. I am flat losing my mind. I don't know about that. Bob shoves his arm through the sling on his lever action and flips it around to his back. He walks over to where I'm sitting, kneels down, and picks up my rifle. See, Alice had green eyes. He opens the bolt of my gun and one by one plucks the cartridges out of the magazine. My hands drop to my sides. It's not the tone that bothers me. His voice is dead calm. It's just that one word he said that makes neck hairs prickle. Had? What do you mean had? He slides the bolt closed and takes a step back. See, I knowed she was having an affair. That's why she was fixing to divorce me. I suspected it was with you, but I weren't so sure. Not till last night. I'd have shot you, but you're my friend. So I lace that coffee of yours with Belladonna instead. Oh, it's poison sure enough, but it don't kill in the usual way. It plays tricks with the mind, makes you go crazy, see things that ain't there. Sort of a window into your thoughts. Gave you a double dose this morning. Thought you'd have flipped by now. Don't matter. You will. I watch him slide my rifle over his empty shoulder, dumbstruck. I can't move. I can't think. Not even when he finishes getting my rifle settled and drops his lever action back down into his hands. That white stag you've seen, he says. That's purity right there. You shot it dead, which means you are guilty as hell, boy. And that green-eyed tree woman you dreamed of? Well, if that ain't Alice, I don't know what is. He steps backward into the brush, gun in hand, never once turning his back on me. Somewhere off in the distance, a strange wolf-like howl rips through the trees. My head jerks towards the sun, but Bob just smiles. Starting, I see. But... This ain't happening. It can't be. Any of it. Bob, I never touched her. I swear to God, I never touched her. Mmm. He hums and pushes his back into the cedar branch. You can lie to me all you want, but you can't lie to yourself. If you are innocent, you ain't got much to worry about. He gives a lazy two-fingered salute and vanishes into the brush. Best of luck, buddy. I don't know how long I sit there watching fairies form out of snowflakes, faces rise and fall out of the rocks and trees, but one thing I do know, I can't stay here. The high for the week was supposed to be ten below. If I try to wait out the poison, I'll freeze to death, but I can't go back to the cabin either. If Bob is there, like as not, he'll kill me. I need to make it to the blacktop and hopefully flag someone down. I twist my wrists against the vines binding my hands, squinting hard until the two-track road comes into focus. It's almost impossible to tell if this is the driveway or not with everything twisting and changing the way it is. I glance up at one of the trees as I pass. The bark shudders. A face presses out of the trunk and fixes its eyes on me. My blood turns to ice. This ain't real. A stick slams into my back. Be silent. A voice behind me moans. 
my gaze falls back to my boots. But this ain't real. It's the poison the belladonna Bob put in my coffee, and this fantasy ain't nothing but a hallucination. That's all. It's a dream. A dream. Halt. The monster behind me groans and wraps its branch-like fingers around my throat. I close my eyes, willing myself to shake it off, but I still hear its wooden body creak as it leans over my head. I still feel the wet tickle of its breath on my cheek. Do not speak until spoken to human. The vines around my wrists loosen, and the creature's voice roars. Hail, Dryad. This is he and his weapon. It is a dream. Dryads don't exist. It's just something Uncle Ed pulled out of his ass. This ain't real. My eyes crack open just in time to watch a branch glide silently overhead, my rifle caught up between the twigs. The very earth cries out for justice. That thing moans as my gun passes from branch to branch. We entreat you, Dryad. Perform your duty. Justice? A woman's voice comes so smooth it almost sings. My gaze follows the sound to the base of an oak just ahead, and there it is. The albino. The buck I shot yesterday, lying dead beside a mound of moss and grass. The limp grass at the top of the mound sways as the woman's voice says, The white stag has been slain. There is no justice in the world of men. Several of the blades part as they move, revealing a single emerald green eye. It glares out at me from between the grass, above a smooth curl of white birch bark sticking out above the moss. The top of the mound dips. A thin pale branch sways out from under the moss, and the entire mass leans sideways, propping its weight on the branch, exactly the way a person might if they was sitting on the ground. My heart rate doubles. It's not a mound at all. It's her, the tree woman. She's a dryad. I swallow, replaying everything that happened yesterday. The floating branches, the flick of the ear, the press of the rifle slamming into my shoulder when I squeeze the trigger, the way the snow exploded around me, and I lost sight of the buck. Why, mortal? The dryad turns to face me without rising, never taking her eyes from mine. Why would you do this thing? But all I can manage is, I, um, uh, ooh. She pushes her grass-like hair from her eyes, revealing her smooth birch bark face, her almost human scowl. I see. She sighs and rises to her feet. Then permit me a guess. I have not seen you in these woods before yesterday. You came to help your friend, as I understand, yes? She steps closer. But the white stag is a trophy without equal. You couldn't possibly pass on such a prize. Her eyebrow twitches up menacingly, but it's like she's listening to my thoughts. I can't help but nod. As I suspected. She sneers, pressing her face closer until the black veins in her irises come into focus, just like in my dream, until the smell of her bark overpowers my senses with the scent of wet earth and wild flowers. Too close. Every part of me aches to run, but I cannot dare not move. Foolish human. Her cat-like pupils narrow. The white stag is the avatar of the spirit of purity, which must be reborn in the flesh of his killer. She presses her middle finger against my forehead. Tingling pain races out from her touch and she pulls away. I can't breathe. I fall on my hands and knees as the hint of a smile creeps across her lips. Go, mortal. But I think you should avoid other hunters from now on. Pain like I've never known ripples under my skin. My fingers melt and join together. White fur sprouts on the back of my hands. But the pain is like nothing I've ever felt before. It courses through my veins like liquid fire. I scream, 
but it ain't my voice that comes, just the loud, lingin' bleat of a buck. I shake my antlers free of my hat and raise my head, but the dryad's gone. In her place stands a tree, shaped like a woman, with the faded outline of a bikini spray-painted onto the bark. Panting, I jerk off my gloves and just sit there, in the middle of the blacktop, staring at my fingers as they open and close into fists, all ten of them, until behind me, the sound of an engine roaring in the distance brings me back to reality. It's a pickup, by the sound of it, and it's closer. I glance back down the road over my shoulder, but I already know it ain't Bob's old Ford. The engine's too quiet. It runs too smooth. Stealing one last glance at the tree, I stagger to my feet and run down the road screaming and waving my arms. I don't know what happens next. Guess I gotta turn old Bob into the sheriff. But that don't matter just now. I made it. I'm gonna live. I hope you enjoyed tonight's story, Dryad, written by Dirk Stevens. Dirk Stevens exists only as a fantasy, more at home among the fairies as goblins of his imagination than roaming the mundane realm of mortals. He's an award-winning member of the Springfield Writers Guild and the author of many dark short stories, including Purgatory, 2021. Lil's single mistake ends her engagement and her life. Now forced to haunt the man she loves, Lil struggles to find a way to keep him alive. Purgatory can be found on Amazon.com. Our minds struggle sometimes with the art of deception under the guise of magic or illusion. We've all questioned if the performer is either incredibly gifted at sleight of hand or truly wrangled to deal with the dark side for a price in trade for fame and fortune. Haven't most of us, when feeling down, Ask the power above to give us something we don't truly understand or are in the right frame of mind to ask? What happens if there are people who follow through somehow with those requests? Is truth sometimes stranger than fiction? Is it? And now for your indulgence, The Illusionist by Eli Pope. The Act The large metal plate was secured with long threaded bolts into the enclosure. These were applied and tightened down by two skimpily clad dark-haired assistants, or vassals as they were called, and appeared to be identical twins. The cage looked to be impenetrable as they then maneuvered it 360 degrees back to face the crowd. Liam had just been chained inside the box before the plate was secured. There was no obvious place for him to retreat or escape as the stage was completely open to the crowd's view. The women banged on the sides of the structure with hammers in various spots to ensure it was solid steel and impermeable. A spectator was invited up to also take his turn at slamming a large heavy hammer upon the walls of the sealed structure. Afterwards, a very large silk sheet was dropped down from wires which hung high above in the ceiling and now draped over the top of the container. Eerie music began to play. The room hushed for a moment, and then a set of hands began to appear pushing the fabric out between the solid steel wall and the silk. The crowd oohed and awed with amazement at the movement underneath the sheet, seeing just moments earlier that there was no way for anyone to be between the two. Music thundered around the theater, causing the seats to vibrate and the spectators' hearts to pound. Nora sat mesmerized front and center. The entire show so far held her attention like flies on a honey-soaked biscuit. She found Liam very titillating, ooh, and magnificent. His show was incredible. He certainly must truly be magical or have made a deal with the devil to hold such powers. There would be no other way these acts were mere trickery or sleight of hand. She longed to be called as a participant in one of his feats of magical deception. Suddenly, the shiny satin sheet parted in the center and there stood half of Liam's naked body outside the box. 
The bottom half of Liam appeared to be melted and molded into the steel sheet. A mix of cold, hard metal and soft human flesh had become one. People gasped aloud, but not as vehemently as Nora. After the crowd settled back down, the sheet was drawn back together tightly, obscuring Liam and his melded steel body once more. Lights flashed and thunder roared before the sheet was lifted into the air again, showing the metal plate still attached firmly. The beautiful vassals again banged the metal sides with hammers before rolling it around 360 degrees. As the vassals removed the bolts, the plate fell forward to the ground showing the cage was empty. A bright flash of light, and suddenly Liam stood on top of the enclosure, statuesque, and gazing out across the vast crowd of stark white eyes. He tossed the chains that once wrapped and secured him down to the ground with a crash as the lights shined brightly in his face. Liam's glowing blue eyes sparkled as he slowly looked down at Nora. She saw him smile and it sizzled into her lips. She felt his internal warmth in that brief second before his instantaneous scrutiny of her continued across the other faces in the crowd. Her mouth cooled almost at once as his head turned towards stage left. She knew at that moment if he didn't call on her, she would return to tomorrow night's show and so on until she was either called upon or his troop traveled on. With each act of magic, Nora tried to explain the deceptions away in her head. Part of her wanted to believe there was a wizard craft within the world, while another side was terrified if there were indeed such madness. Any human capable of true powers such as this would most certainly crumble to the magnitude of temptations they would entice. By the evening's end, she had not been fortunate enough to be called upon. She felt very let down. Her green eyes saddened as the curtains fell and the applause ended with other spectators getting up from their seats and moving toward the outside aisles to exit. She thought to herself, if only I wait until I'm the last one to leave, just maybe... Nora walked out into the chilly evening onto the sidewalk in front of the Theatre Outremont in Montreal. It would be about a 35 to 40 minute Uber ride back home to her lonely apartment near the Prairies River. Another Friday evening finish alone. Maybe a bottle of Malbec by the gas fireplace tonight to take the chill off and relax. Mildred, her sweet companion dog, would enjoy snuggling at her feet while she daydreamed about the astounding Liam Bernier and plan what to wear to tomorrow night's show to entice his attention toward her. She had felt guilty about her newfound feelings, but Gerard had passed, and she was lonely. She missed him horribly, but he wouldn't want her to suffer alone. Not after this amount of time. The dark sedan sat idling on the alley side of the venue, cold smoke pouring from the tailpipe spilling the engine's heat into the street. Nora pulled her coat collar together around her neck as she began to slowly walk toward the parked vehicle. She glanced around both to her left and right, noticing no one else nearby. The sidewalks empty and street silent, except for the low rumble of the dark four-door car that must be her Uber. She suddenly felt a chill rush down her spine. It seemed slightly different than a shiver from the cold. Was it a warning of impending danger or cause for concern? she internally questioned. The front passenger side window began to slide downward into the door. A silhouette of the driver barely broke the darkness enough to be seen. Ms. Nora Fontaine. Nora's footsteps halted about four feet from the door, her face instantly painting concern. She hadn't given the Uber company her married name from her deceased husband who had passed three years earlier. The information with Uber listed her as Nora Patella, her maiden name. Her veins iced as a rush of wispy breath escaped her lips. The sedan slowly pulled forward until the back door was even with Nora's body. Should I run? She quickly asked herself. Her eyes darted around, searching the empty sidewalk for anyone's help. The rear window now began to slide slowly down, disappearing. Question quickly morphed into panic as the perception of her dilemma began to take hold. The rows of hundreds of bright light bulbs that lined the marquee and theater front along with the roof outline instantly darkened with an electrical click. Only one billboard remained lit on the front of the Outremont Theater. The astounding Liam Bernier in bold white letters above Liam's mesmerizing eyes which shined a bright searing blue, yet hollow and smoky.
The Enticement. Nora could see the heat rising from the roof of the sedan. Her skin felt frigid cold to the bone standing in the late November evening air. She had nowhere to run or anyone to count on in the oddly empty Montreal streets. It was late, just after 11, but it was a Friday evening. Where were all the people? Soft words broke the silence as they emanated from within the idling automobile. Miss Nora, it's okay, it's me, Liam. Nora's attention snapped instantly. She did recognize his voice. She took a caution to step forward as she stooped down to peer into the dark opened rear window. She saw two spheres of cold sapphire blue eyes which instantly penetrated her soul. Nora love, I heard you earlier. A slender smooth hand began to reach outward into the cold. You said you wanted to disappear like my assistant. The pointing finger began to curl upward and then move back and forth towards the dark interior as if to silently call out and lead Nora towards him like a magnet attracts metal to itself. This is your chance, Nora. It will be your only call from me. Come if you want to experience my magic. Nora's first urge was to answer the call by moving forward to the open window. The danger she had just felt suddenly lifted as if dissipating into the frozen night. She looked skyward to thank the good Lord above for both answering her call for safety and for the chance to meet the astounding Liam like she had begged. The emptiness that filled her for the last three years suddenly felt as if it were a heavy wave now receding, leaving her weightless and floating in the summer warmth. This was her chance to escape the cold dread of what life had left her holding after Gerard passed away. She smiled as she reached for the outheld hand. She moved the two or three extra steps to be able to finish her reach for Liam's fingers. Just as the door opened wide and their skin touched, a brief flight of warning coursed throughout her body. Her eyes gazed upward again to the clouds, which were whitened briefly by the bright full moon. Brilliant bright orbs reflected off her green eyes and back into the shiny black paint of the car. The emerald flash diminished instantly as she slid through the doorframe of the sedan into the seat. Her brief plausibility of escape vanished as the door slammed closed and the sedan pulled away quickly to disappear into the distance of the vacant night. The Deception Oh, Liam. Nora spoke softly as she still held tightly to his hand. This is so exciting. I was frightened just seconds ago, wondering how I would escape ill intentions from whomever sat inside this automobile. She smiled, patiently awaiting his response, which seemed to evaporate into the silence that swallowed her into the darkness from the moment she had slid into the leather seat. Her mind tugged at her to turn and face Liam as she awaited his answer, but something impeded her ability to force the muscles to respond and make it happen. It was as if she were trapped by an invisible cage. The road ahead, nor the driver, were visible any longer to her. She hadn't noticed it at first when she sat. Now she realized the front of the vehicle was pitch black, as if covered by something dark. She felt movement, but saw no headlights, no operator, no street lamps, nor lights of any sort. The movement forward instantly accelerated with no sound, but a swooshing noise, as if slicing through the air. She felt dizzy. Her eyes sought solace inside the cover of her lids. She couldn't fight the urge to close her eyes tightly. She's perfect, Liam. Vassal One spoke. Yes, Liam, she is the perfect choice, mirrored Vassal Two. They usually are when they want it so badly themselves. When life is just too overwhelmingly empty on their own, much like yours were before I found you two sisters. Yes, Liam, we were not only identical in sisterhood, but barrenness also, stated one. Alone and needy, thank you, Liam, for taking us in, echoed two. You both will be responsible for shaping her, teaching her. Liam's eyes became bluer as he held the glass of liquid to his lips. I expect perfection from her, as I demand it from both of you. It will be done, they spoke in unison. The moon continued to beam brightly in between moments the clouds parted enough 
to allow the shine to penetrate the dark starless night. Nora began to stir. Her mind was hollow. She felt almost as if she were drugged. There were thoughts she seemed almost aware of, but couldn't comprehend what was happening. Nora was unable to string together any events of what had led her to this mental vacancy. She tried to concentrate and force thoughts of what could have happened. She felt warmth on either side of her. Fleshy warmth. Her neck felt stiff, but she was able to turn, and when she did, she saw her. She quickly turned the opposite, and as she did, it was as if she stared into a mirror. The exact face appeared on both sides of her. A blanket of warmth became instantly evident on either leg at the same time. A hand from each woman settled in assurance on each knee. It's okay, Nora. You are Liam's. Everything will become as it should be very soon. Very soon. I am one. I am two. Nora's head snapped instantly to her right as two spoke. What? I... I don't... under... understand. Her eyes bounced back and forth between the women on either side. What do you mean I am Liam's? I need to go home. You are home, Nora. This is your home. One replied. Yes, Nora, this is your home. We are all Liam's. You'll learn. Two chimed in. Nora's eyes beamed of confusion. She shook her head back and forth. But I... I have a talk. I need to... He needs fed, and... That world is no longer there for you, answered one. You are now Liam's vassal. Vassal? What do you mean? Nora questioned. Vassal, assistant, slave, one replied. No! I'm no one's slave or vassal, or... Nora screamed. Two cleared her throat. Oh, but you asked, even begged. We both heard you. You were going to come back tomorrow if it hadn't happened tonight. You were never forced. Liam can't initiate with force. Nora shook her head back and forth in disagreement until her chin fell to her chest, overwhelmed with what she was hearing. I've been tricked. Lied to. Deceived. Lord, help me. Oh, Nora, the Lord doesn't even acknowledge our home, you silly girl. One snickered. No, no, Nora. You mustn't even say that name. That will anger Liam. When you asked to be Liam's, you were banished from asking any safety or help from the other one. Two answered. You silly girl. She guffawed. Vassal one and two leaned forward where they could see each other in front of Nora. Silly girl. They spoke in unison as they smiled blankly and then sat back, hands still on each of Nora's knees. The Realization Nora quickly realized she had been horribly deceived. She had seen the astounding Liam Bernier as a magnificent magical man, one she had wanted so badly to meet and be part of his illusion. She had been so lonely after her husband Gerard had passed. Poor Gerard had suffered for months, with nothing she could do but watch life slowly drain from his body. She now shared a feeling she just knew was similar. There were no days in her world any longer. There was nothing to look forward to. At least Gerard had been able to be somewhat comforted by her, if nothing else, just seeing her and knowing she was sticking with him till the end. Nora wasn't afforded even that benefit. One and two claimed to be her family, but she knew she was nothing more than number three to them. They were all three empty souls who had been deceived by Liam the Devil. She wasn't even sure why he had laid claim to her. He didn't talk to her. He never tried anything sexual with her. She was certain he hadn't attempted anything like that with one or two either. All they ever did was rehearse their parts for the show. She didn't believe he really needed them for that either. It wasn't illusions. She had quickly realized there were no special pieces of equipment or purchased tricks. It was all truly magic. Liam needed nothing or no one to help deceive or trick the crowds. It was all just one big magic evil illusion. Her realization had just come moments too late. 
She remembered in her distant past the night she had gone to see Liam at the Outremont. Her excitement, enhanced by the chill in the air, the lights, the sound, the thundering music. She also remembered the instant of a warning deep within her soul telling her not to step into the open car door. Why didn't I listen? Why am I being punished? I was a good wife. I was a loving person. And what about poor Mildred, my abandoned dog? Instant sadness overcame Nora once again. Realization of what she had so easily given up was now her internal and eternal hell. Would Liam ever grow tired of this or me and maybe let me go back? I pray constantly for it, even though his two vassals warn me not to do so. The Show Time droned on for Nora. She learned her part of the act, and as the tour continued, it seemed she began to understand more and more of what Liam's purpose for them was truly for. After each night's show, the dark sedan would remain parked along the show's venue late into the evening until yet another volunteer would cautiously saunter up to the vehicle. Nora would sit beside her and usher her into Liam's fold. He was collecting women to recruit to his colony. She wasn't certain what for, but the numbers grew. She wondered how she had remained able to keep one corner of her mind to herself and coherent of what was happening. One and two were total converts and seemed to no longer be capable of remembering their past. They had become mindless machines while she herself was still capable of free thought. She could not, however, come up with a plan of escape and feared if she thought too hard about it, either Liam or one of the vassals may become aware. She would bide her time and fight any urges to further lose any of her memory or soul to Liam. She would play the game and stick it out. What other option did she have? She was a prisoner, and the show would go on. The Existence Nora had become conditioned. It had been forever since her thoughts of home, other than with her fellow vassals, had entered her mind. Any memories of past happiness, fears, or existence before Liam had all but disappeared into the dark shadows of her previous world. She had become number three and didn't fight any part of it. It was home. One, two, and all the others she had helped convert were family. It seems Liam's illusions had transformed into the reality she haplessly became entrapped. Night after night, show after show, deception after deception, the machine chugged on. Those first two assistants, vassals, were correct. The Lord was indeed restricted from any existence within Liam's illusion, or world. The converts would enter, and Nora would see their resistance to accepting their fate dissipate until they too would become a mindless vassal to Liam. Much like someone back in the real world experiencing their first homeless night after losing everything. It hurt horribly at first wandering aimlessly in search of an escape until the dull drone of nothing ever coming to fruition or anyone coming to aid beat them down into the mold of being unworthy of what once was. Nora had seen it happen over and over. She had fought like hell to keep those memories alive so she wouldn't fade into the nothingness of Liam's world. She fought his illusion that she held no value other than to cling to whatever he allowed her to feel. But then one day, she too felt nothing but the urge to wander, just waiting to either suffer to have feeling inside or to just give out and die, which didn't seem to exist in Liam's illusion. Only the show, only the deception, only the endless feeling of numbness. Even the brush of skin from one of the others brought no feeling or warmth. One might as well have been encased within some sort of shell like a turtle, to block any sensations of physical or mental contact. None existed and nothing was missed anymore. They were there only for Liam. The Outremont There were only so many theaters throughout the world that booked the astounding Liam Bernier illusionist show. This fact made it inevitable Liam's troupe would repeat its schedule at some point. It had been over a year since Nora had purchased her ticket and attended the show. 
That show, which used her loneliness and sadness in her life to aid his lure of her into his deception of something magical and exciting. The trick to entice her into his controlling grip. As the show started, the thunderous music boomed. This was how every illusion began of Liam's. Colored lights flashed and swirled throughout the venue, drumming the audience into the beginnings of the intoxicating excitement. Each show always focused on only one target, one female who would be deceived after the show. The entire performance was orchestrated to entice and ensnare that one chosen female audience member. As Liam performed each of his acts, conversing with certain audience members and calling them up to be part of the Flash, his vassals, which Nora was now a part of, assisted in the magic of the illusions which enthralled the crowd. The room was filled with enthusiasm and applause as the momentum of the evening built. Nora watched the chosen woman as she sat in the front row, seeing her anticipation of hope building within to be called upon. Each woman always appeared to beg for the call up to the stage. Nora slowly began experiencing feelings she hadn't felt before. At least not that came to her immediate memory. There was a vague familiarity to it all, though. That suspicion seemed to grow within every time she looked at the excitement in the face of the unknown lady who always sat front and center. She watched her eyes at the beginning of each spectacle and how a sadness grew across her face at not being chosen. She realized this was all part of the act in grooming the woman's desire to open herself up to Liam even more after the show. Disgust began to grow inside Nora for her part in this act. She became repulsed with herself for being instrumental in Liam's intentional brainwashing. Her memory quickly became clear of feelings she now felt being ushered back to her own circumstance. She fought those feelings at first, believing she was being tempted to betray Liam. She wondered if maybe the Lord were indeed inside this theater, mounting an attack on Liam, her master and family. Her eyes glanced back and forth between one and two, attempting to take notice if they too were aware of anything but their eyes seemed to show no tells of any consequence. Nora saw nothing but the usual blankness and their shared rehearsed roles in assisting Liam. Nora's mind became a battlefield and her concentration became more difficult to maintain. Liam's sapphire blue eyes shot daggers into Nora's emerald greens. She felt his discipline and regained her composure. Liam's mind control was winning, although he looked as if he had never confronted such a problem with any other vassal before. She suddenly realized she'd be reprimanded at some point tonight. That thought struck fear within. The show continued to its finality and slowly the crowd dispersed as usual. Like a year earlier, Liam sat along with two vassals, this time Nora and one, sitting and waiting in the darkness of the black sedan, lingering on the empty street corner for Nikita Devane, his newest chosen target from this show waiting to see the young woman sadly exit the venue's doors. Liam's eyes sizzled. Nora could feel the intensity within the vehicle they sat. Vassal One sat next to Liam, she next to the door where Nikita would be drawn over to enter. Footsteps sounded across the cement sidewalk. Feminine steps from heels clicked out and away from the entrance, but then came to a silenced halt. Nora peered through the darkened glass at the woman who also glanced around at the empty sidewalk and streets. Deja vu for Nora that suddenly felt prickly and new to her, in an odd feeling of cognizance. It felt almost spooky to her. She glanced over at one and then Liam briefly before turning back toward the woman who appeared becoming cautiously frustrated. The front window slid down slowly as the driver called out, Ms. Nikita Devane, at which the woman turned with a look of cautious concern. Are you my Uber? She asked. Why, yes, ma'am, I am. Nora heard something from across the quiet street that drew her attention. It all happened in an odd sequence as the sedan window began to roll back up and the car moved slowly forward until the back door lined up with Nikita. The back window rolled down and Liam began to invite her over toward the rear door. Welcome, Ms. Nikita Devane. I'm Liam. A distant dog barked across the street, breaking the quiet of the night, interrupting Liam's standard welcoming and alluring line. 
Nora's emerald green eyes shot to the right, staring past Nikita to the sidewalk across the street. She saw the barking dog and suddenly recalled a memory of an animal named Mildred that flashed into her head. An instant awakening overtook her when she realized it was Mildred. Her Mildred. As soon as that realization came into focus, she caught the flash of oncoming headlights racing down the road towards them. She saw Mildred begin to step into the street from across the way from where they were parked. Without thinking, her hand grasped the door handle and tugged upwards as if driven by muscle memory. She quickly threw her legs out and onto the sidewalk as the swinging door knocked Nikita tumbling to the ground. Nora stepped over Nikita and screamed for her to run at the top of her lungs. Without missing a step, she hurriedly continued across the sidewalk and into the street. Nikita watched the woman's attempt to save the dog from being hit by the speeding car. There were suddenly several series of mixed sounds. A dog barking, a woman screaming Mildred, another woman screaming help at the top of her lungs, and then screeching tires on pavement just before an animal's yelp that was quickly followed by loud thumps. God damn it! Liam cursed when his assistant, one, spilled out onto the sidewalk from the still open doors, the black sedan's tires squealed and sped off down the street at high speed. A minute later, as Liam's car raced through a second red light several blocks down, a loud explosion sounded just before a huge pall of flame shot skyward as his car collided with another that was entering the intersection at the same time. Nikita climbed up onto her feet and ran to the spot that the woman who yelled, Run, now lay. She was lying still beside the dog in the middle of the road just in front of the stalled auto. The car's headlights pointed downward in a crumpled direction to a bleeding dog that whimpered as it attempted to drag its own body to the motionless woman. As Nikita reached her, the dog began to lick at the woman's face before whimpering and nestling its head into her side. The driver of the vehicle climbed out of his car and ran to the front, kneeling to check on Nora. Oh my God, I didn't see them. I swear I couldn't stop. Somebody call 911. The confused vassal, one, sat on the concrete near the spot she had dove from Liam's car. She seemed dazed as if she didn't understand what was happening. She made no attempts to move from where she sat, but appeared to be looking for something in the area near her. She looked confused as she hollered, Two? Where are you? Help me, Two. I need you. Liam is gone. The sidewalk instantly began to fill in with people, appearing more like a typical Friday evening. Pedestrians from nowhere suddenly rushed over to Nora and Mildred, along with the man who had hit them. Nikita, who was covering the woman with her coat, was crying, but trying to reassure the motionless woman with the dog. Others ran to Liam's one, who sat alone on the empty corner, attempting to calm her and confused why she was hollering out the number two as if it were something lost and needed. Sirens soon sounded in the distance of both the spot Nora lay silent and several blocks up where Liam's car had crashed and lay in flames still licking the night's sky. Thick black smoke continued pouring down the darkening street. It caused a flickering effect from the flashes of firelight occasionally escaping the tower of smoke. The Aftermath the moment Nora and Mildred were hit, a bright light ushered them into a new world. Actions, of course, that weren't seen by anyone here on Earth. The bodies appeared to lie motionless to those watching or trying to treat them, but Nora and Mildred had already left that world and now arrived at a new place where she and her sweet loving dog were greeted by Gerard, the husband she had loved for nine years before he passed. It seems that a power much stronger than Liam's did in fact exist and to overcome the darkness Nora had somehow survived until tonight. Maybe her faith remained strong enough and her refusal to lose it was what brought her back. Or possibly a strong enough desire to meet back up with her family she had been separated from was the miracle behind it all. That story would be left behind for the world she left to sort out. All she knew was the overwhelming feeling of warmth and love had finally found itself surrounding the Fontaine family once again, from husband and wife all the way to their faithful dog, who somehow was at the core of it all. Back at Earth's world, Nikita Devane would more than likely never understand just how near her life came to an evil shattering change 
from the evening she experienced at the astounding Liam Bernier illusionist experience on opening night at the Outremont. Sometimes this world seems intricately strung together. The mere flick of a gnat becomes able to cause a chain reaction to a series of previously unconnected circumstances involving people to be adversely affected. Much like the action of one domino overturning onto another and so forth down the string until the final act forces the last domino to hit the ground, causing one horrible outcome to be avoided with an offering of a differing horrible outcome being the acting force. Luck of the draw or an orchestrated master plan with intention. Saturday evening's news in Montreal played out in a similar fashion, leading to a series of unanswerable questions as the headlines announced the death of illusionist Liam Bernier and others in an evening of chaos near the Outremont Theatre. Special report from Channel 10 Montreal News. It seems world-famous illusionist Liam Bernier died instantly in a fiery car crash which happened directly after an unrelated woman, Nora Fontaine, who had been missing from the Outremont almost a year to date, was run over merely seconds earlier than Liam's accident. The two accidents appear somewhat related. A woman named Nikita Devane insisted that the victim, Nora Fontaine, was hit while trying to save a dog after first warning herself of an impending danger tied to Liam's car. Friends of Nora Fontaine's past have now come forward and stated the dog Nora attempted to save was in fact previously her own pet before she vanished one year ago from the Outremont on a Friday evening much like last night's. Around this same time, only three years earlier, another young woman and her twin sister wound up missing from the Outremont after also attending a Liam Bernier illusionist show. One of those twins, Magnolia Jones, was mysteriously found on the sidewalk of the Outremont last night near the scene of Nora Fontaine's death. Magnolia was incoherent and still supposedly holds no recollection of her past up to and including the last three years she and her sister, Amber Jones, have been missing. Nikita Devane states that she is certain the woman, Magnolia Jones, was in fact inside the vehicle along with Liam and an unnamed driver before it sped off. Nikita Devane had just exited the astounding Liam Bernier's illusionist experience and was about to step inside Liam's sedan just before Nora jumped out and quickly yelled for her to run as she entered the street to save a dog from being hit. Liam's car sped off and exploded in the fiery crash several blocks north of the Outremont moments after Nora and Magnolia exited the rear door of the sedan. This story is confusing and odd. Hopefully, with some further investigation, it will be sorted out eventually. It just goes to prove the adage, sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. More updates as soon as they are made available. sure hope you enjoyed tonight's tale, The Illusionist, by Eli Pope. Eli Pope is a major writing contributor for Fear from the Heartland. Eli began his love of creating stories back in high school creative writing classes. The passion lay dormant for decades, while life took him different directions. The stories never left, and he finally succumbed to the voices in his head, telling him to put them on paper. And put them on paper he did, earning the Literary Titan Award for The Judgment Game and The Spark of Wrath, books one and two of the Mason Jar series, which you, dear listener, can hear on audible.com, performed by yours truly, Paul J. McSorley. The only thing I will tell you, Billy J. Cater is a bad dude. You can hook up with Eli Pope at his website, elipope.com. That's Eli, E-L-I, Pope, P-O-P-E, dot com. He can also be located on Facebook at author Eli Pope, or search groups on Facebook, The Mason Jar Room. The 
If you enjoyed tonight's story hosted by yours truly, Paul J. McSorley, you can search my name on Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on YouTube for additional previous stories. If you'd like to hear more lengthy tales, be sure to take a look at my audiobooks. Available now on audible.com or just visit paulsbooks.net. That's P-A-U-L-S-B-O-O-K-S dot net. You can also find me personally on Facebook and Twitter. And with that, listeners, our weekly journey into the psyche has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight's episode and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host, for Fear from the Heartland, Paul J. McSorley. I've enjoyed the titillation tonight. Ooh, there's that word again. Thank you for joining me. Hope to see you again next week at Fear from the Heartland. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.